The Virginia Horse Industry Board and the Virginia Christmas Tree Growers Association are proud sponsors of Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. This week, we travel to Reedville, Virginia, and learn more about the Menhaden fishing industry. These fish are wild caught, so they're not considered part of our aquaculture commodities. But it's a story with a lot of history and significance to our Commonwealth. I hope you enjoy this special edition of Virginia Farming. Today we're visiting Reedville, Virginia. It's a small town in the northern neck that hosts a very large industry. The Menhaden fish industry has been big here since the 1800s. We're going to visit Omega Protein and find out exactly what they do with these Menhaden fish. But first, we're going to get a historical aspect here at the Reedville Fisherman's Museum. We're inside the beautiful Reedville Fisherman's Museum, and I'm joined by historian Donald George. Mr. George, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. I'd like to start out with a little bit of history about the Menhaden fish, the fish itself. How did we get to know this fish? The Menhaden fish, fishing industry is, has been since the settlers came here, and up until the mid 1850s, it was an, strictly agricultural. When you say agricultural, they used to plant the fish in the ground with the corn, right. didn't they? Right. But then there was a lady in bar, she was cooking Manhattan fish for her chickens, and she skimmed off the top of it and, and saved the oil and took it to Boston to an oil merchant, and uh, that shifted the need for Menhaden. How long has the Menhaden fishing industry been here in Reedville? Uh, 1865, 66. Uh, and then uh, it started when Elijah Reed uh, left his business up in Brookline, Maine. And, uh, he saw there was a decline in number of fish up there, so he moved it first to Old Point Comfort. They had two sailboats, and, and they used what they call kettle fish. They put them in great big kettles and heat them and cook them that way, and then hand press the uh, oil out of the fish and take the fish scrap and put it on the dock and let the sun dry. And uh, then he moved up the bay to catch some fish shack, which was right on the bay with, where they used strictly a wholesale method of catching the fish. And then he moved to Cockles Creek. And Cockles Creek at one time had a lot of what they call points, the points of land come out, and every point had a little fish factory on it, and most of them were kettle factories. Well, and, and Cockrell's Creek now is where the Omega Protein right. factory is. That's the one that remains. Right. In all these years of the Menhaden fishing, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen? Well, be, one of the big, I was thinking about that, one of the biggest changes has been the airplane. They first started using the airplane to find the fish, and they could go in a half an hour where the boats could go all day looking for them. And secondly, I would say was nylon knit. Otherwise, the cotton knits had to be cured every day and would rot rather fast in the heat. And they didn't have the strength. And then the next thing was the power block. And that was a labor-saving device. And what does the power block do? 
It, you know, the power block retrieves the net. Okay. And bring the fish up into a tight V shape where they come up with a big steam and pick them up. Okay. And that's what used to be done by all the men on the boat would pull at the same time and... Yes. Well, Mr. George, thank you so much for having us here today. It's, it's been a pleasure and this museum is absolutely a treasure. It is. A lot of work is going into it. Thank you very much. We appreciate mm -hmm. that. So now we're going to go across the creek to Omega Proteins. Well, here we are at Omega Protein on the Cockrell Creek here in Reedville, and I'm joined by Director of Fishing Operations, Monty Deal. Hi. Monty, thanks so much for having us out today. Oh, thanks for visiting. So start off by giving us an, an idea of what Omega Protein does. Well, Omega Protein is a health and nutrition company. We actually produce uh, heart-healthy omega-3 fish oils and also high-protein fish meals uh, for both human and animal consumption. Now, how long has Omega Protein been here at this plant? There has been a continuous Menhaden reduction plant here on this site since 1878. 1878. And it started out as Haney? As Haney Snow and Company, uh, this industry had numerous small family-run operations back in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Throughout the years, as the industry became more mechanized, there's been an awful lot of industry consolidation to the point where we're now, uh, this is the sole plant left on the Atlantic coast. So being the sole plant, how many fish go out of here a week? Or come in, I guess, come in a week? Uh, on average, we process between 15 and 18 million uh, fish a week here at this plant during the season. The fish come in on the boats, but what leaves this plant? Uh, what leaves this plant here is uh, fish oil, uh, both crude and refined. We have our own oil refinery here on site. After we render the fish into their fish meal and fish oil components, the oil is then refined for various uh, uh, users, uh, users' needs, whether it's high-end veterinary feeds or whether it goes on and be concentrated for up to and including human consumption. And then we have a fish meal product that's very high in, in protein that's used for livestock feeds, uh, uh, pet, pet feeds, as well as aquaculture feeds. And what is your fishing season? Do you fish for these Menhaden year-round? No, this is actually a seasonal fishery. Uh, Atlantic Menhaden are migratory. In the winter, they go down off the coast of Georgia and northern Florida. As the waters warm up, they begin to migrate north, uh, arriving here off the Virginia coast somewhere around March and April. Uh, our season will typically start in early to mid-May. Uh, we'll fish up until uh, normally late November to early December when the fish are migrating back down the coast. And at that point, they get really out of our range uh, as they're moving back down the coast. How does that work for your employees if you don't, if you're not fishing and you're not bringing fish in over the winter? Well, our, our fishermen are considered seasonal. Once our season ends in late November, they actually go on and have other jobs. Many of them have other commercial fishing type jobs, whether it be gill net, uh, oyster, uh, and some are carpenters. They do various things uh, that they've done over the years. They have a secondary skill. Our plant workers, who constitute about half of our employees, they do work year round. Uh, at that point, we'll use that what we call off-season time to tear down our equipment, rebuild what we need to, to do, as well as our vessels, haul our vessels, and perform scheduled maintenance on them so that when May comes around, we're ready to, to start all over again. You guys fish from where to where? What's your general fishing area? We typically fish from uh, as far north as the coast of New Jersey and as far south as about Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. And what do you think makes the Menhaden so plentiful in that area, in those areas? Well, the, the Menhaden has a huge biomass. It's spawning stock potential, considering that a single Menhaden can lay as many as 300,000 eggs, uh, and that we really are one of the very few fisheries on this uh, particular biomass. It's also very popular for, for bait, for both lobster bait, uh, crab bait, crawfish bait. So there is a separate bait industry that fishes on this uh, stock. but there's nowhere near the, the, the uh, harvesting pressure on this stock that would uh, deplete its, its vast numbers out in the Atlantic. I want to get a little bit uh, more personal now. 
Um, I heard that you are a fourth generation Menhaden fisherman. I am a fourth generation Menhaden fisherman. My great grandfather, my grandfather, and my father were all captains here at this very plant. Uh, all of my uncles were captains here. I worked on the boat here with my father uh, going through school and through college. Uh, after college, I went into the Air Force and retired uh, out of the Air Force as an officer uh, and found myself back here. My son uh, is a 24-year-old mate on one of these boats, making him a fifth-generation fisherman in our family. Uh, my brother is a fish spotter here. My, I have numerous cousins here, and my father-in-law holds the distinction of being our longest serving employee at this plant at over 50 years as an engineer. Wow. I'd say this is almost a family business. This is a family business, and, and many of our employees are multi, multi-generational and have many family members here working right now. Can you describe for me a day in the life of a Menhaden fisherman? Yeah, it's, it's a very long week. It's a very uh, difficult week. Um, we start our week, we only fish Monday through Friday. We do not fish on, on weekends to avoid conflict with other vessels who are out for pleasure purposes. But a typical week starting for us for on Sunday morning, uh, our fish spotters who go up in uh, Cessna 172s and, and locate the large schools in Menhaden, they'll fly on Sunday mornings and do what I call a reconnaissance. They'll fly from New Jersey down to uh, the coast of North Carolina. They'll land in the middle of the day and they'll then do what they, we call a fish report. And they'll, they'll write up where they saw fish, whether it be 10 million fish two miles off of Ocean City, Maryland, 15 million fish eight miles off Virginia Beach. And they'll compile this reconnaissance report and they'll call all of our captains at home. And they'll tell those captains where they saw those fish. A captain then will really have to use his experience and what he believes those fish will do based on the weather conditions for the next week and he'll decide where he wants his boat to be on Monday morning when the sun comes up to, to give him and his crew the best chance of catching as many fish as, as they can. If that means they need to be in Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, that captain will call his men and say, be aboard the boat at two o'clock Sunday afternoon, we have a long ride. Or if it's right here nearby in the Chesapeake Bay, they may not leave the dock until 3 a.m. Monday morning. But that captain wants to have his boat where he believes he and his crew can catch the most fish when that sun comes up. And on Monday morning, typically about 20 to 30 minutes before the sun comes up, our fish spotters take off so that they are over those areas when the sun comes up. And we essentially the hunt begins at that point. Uh, as soon as those captains have enough fish on that boat to warrant them coming back to the plant, they'll come back here, they'll offload in the course of you know, three to five hours per boat, depending on where they are in line that night. And as soon as they get back, back out, uh, get their fish out, they'll head back out, out in the bay or down off the coast to get back to where they want to be the next day. And that cycle will continue until Friday when the sun goes down, when all the boats will come back to the dock. Well, Monty, thank you so much for taking your time to talk to us today. I think we're going to go see if we can find Andy Hall, and he's going to walk us through the processing. Excellent. Thank you for being here. Thanks. So we've followed up with Omega Proteins Assistant General Manager Andy Hall. Andy, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you very much for being here. So we're here on the docks. What happens here? Well, this is where as our vessels come in from the bay and the Atlantic Ocean, our fish come in here and we hook them up to these big pumps and they're pumped into our holding bin from where they go through the plant to be processed. And there's a lot of pipes around us. Yes, they are, they are pumped out of the boats up through this big piping system where the fish and the water are separated up on the top. The water goes back to the boats to be reused and the fish go into our holding bin and from there they go through the plant to be processed. Okay, so are we going to take a look at that plant next? Yes, we are. All right. Sure. And something that I think is amazing here is that it's all menhaden. Everyone I is menhaden. I don't see any other kind of fish. I don't see a crab. I don't Nothing. see a shrimp. And it's one of the great things about our fishery. It's probably the cleanest fishery in the world. Now, I want to talk about uh, the age of the fish. You guys don't catch the really young fish. We Why do is not. That? We do not want the young, we don't catch any fish less than one year old. Our gear prohibits us, prohibits us from catching them. The, the size of the net allows the juvenile, the young ones, to swim through. We would much rather catch them one or two years later when their, their oil content is greater. And it doesn't affect the ecosystem because most predator fish are eating the very small ones, which are the ones we purposely do not target. 
So walk us through the processing. Okay. When when these fish come off the boat, they go through the pipes. We saw them go through the auger. That's right, into the box. And the next step is to go into the cooker. They're cooked at, what do we run that, Charlie? 205 degrees or something? Yeah. For it takes about a 20 minute transient time to go through there. Once they come through there in 20 minutes, they're cooked. So then what happens is all of this fish musk, each cooker is attached to its own individual, it's a screw press. It's really just something that takes a volume that's one by one foot and compresses it to a volume that's three inches by three inches. And the whole time it's compressing it, that material is surrounded by a very fine stainless steel screen, so the liquid is being extruded out. After the press, we now have two products. We have a solid product, that's the flesh, the bones, the scales, every part of the fish. The other side is the liquid side that has water and oil, blood, whatever liquid came with the fish. And we handle those two product lines separately. The oil and water is still mixed. Okay. And some dissolved solids, some very fine solids that comes through that screen. So we have this group of decanters up here. So all of that liquid water and oil mixture still is pumped through those decanters and it removes the solids. Still doesn't do anything with the oil. And we have another whole separate process over there that makes the oil water separation, some high speeds. The way we produce our oil is we batch it. We run until we fill this tank up with oil then we do a QC analysis of it, and we report it to Jane over at HSC, and she'll say, okay, Andy, tank three goes to tank 75. And we have a, a tank farm operator who comes and pumps that number three tank to tank 75. From then on, it's HSC's, it's HSC's oil then. So the fish have been pressed, and the oil and water are going to one area. Mm -hmm. what, about, what about the solids? The solid yeah. material has, has a two-step drying process. When it, when it leaves the presses here, it's about 50% moisture, 50% solids. So it, we put it into this first bank of dryers, we call them steam dryers. It goes in there at about 50% solids, give or take, and comes out at 38%. This 38% moisture material that comes out of here, these are the two new dryers that, that were serial numbers one and two in the United States. These are, these are big rotating drums, and it used to be they just had a really big fire in the end of them. And the combustion gas and the steam that was coming out of the fish as you dried it from 38% to 8%, which is about what we dry our meal to, all mixed together went up a 150 foot tall stack and it looked like a foggy day around here and it smelled very fishy. The only thing that comes out of these dryers when you walk out, you'll see is water. And at, at that point, it's really finished. Can you give me an idea of who purchases your fish meal? Uh, China is, our, I believe, to be our biggest customer, mostly for feeding baby pigs and aquaculture. Uh, we sell a lot of fish meal to the Philippines. We sell the Saudi Arabia, the, the people in Saudi Arabia, their entire dairy herd is fed from fish meal right here at Reedville. They will not accept fish meal from anywhere but Reedville. Uh, we, and in this country, a lot of aquaculture, uh, still a lot of feeder pigs, dairy cows, uh, poultry people. Those are the uh, Mars pet food, hot, especially high-end pet foods that want the benefits of omega-3. Omega-3 the, and the high protein. And the high protein. That meal is about 66% protein right there. Well, we've caught up with Bill Purcell, and he's the environmental manager here at Omega Protein. Bill, thanks for, thanks for taking time out of your day to talk to us. Sure, anytime. A plant this size has got to put off some kind of waste. What do you do? Well, uh, our, our primary waste stream is the water that we evaporate and squeeze out of the fish. Um, it's primarily distilled water, and the pollutant that we have to remove from it is ammonia. And the, the way we remove the ammonia is a physical chemical process. Uh, when, it, when it comes to me, um, it's in the form of ammonium, which is a water-soluble ion. I know the chemistry geeks in the, in the crowd will enjoy that, but you can't get it out of the water. So what we do, we raise pH up to 10.3 with caustic, and then we put it in ammonia strippers. Uh, ammonia strippers are tall towers that are filled with, uh, we call them tellerets, and they're basically plastic balls that look like wiffle balls. And it increases the surface area of the water we spray over them. And then from the bottom of the towers, we force air, and it strips the ammonia out. And we strip 96% of the ammonia out of the water that we see. 
And so essentially what we're left with is very clean distilled water but it's high pH, so we can't discharge it, we can't use it, so we neutralize it with CO2. This, what you expire in your breath, CO2 gas, and we bring the pH down between six and nine. When you look at the water, it's high quality, it's e easy to use, and I decided we shouldn't discharge this, so we use it in the plant. We use it for plant makeup water, we, uh, uh, for makeup water for our cooling towers, we use it for plant washdown water, and for vacuum seal water. And ultimately, we plan on using it for boiler feed water because the water is actually better quality than the water that we pull out of the ground that we're using for our, for our boilers right now. How are your environmental management techniques kept in check? We have a number of permits. We have a Title V air permit. We have a VPDS water permit. We have stormwater permits. We have a groundwater withdrawal permit. We have a nutrient management permit. We have lots of permits, and that has lots of reporting and testing requirements. So, and we also have periodic inspections from state and federal officials. So you have eyes on everything that you do here? We do, we do. What do you say to the naysayers who say, there's no way a company that size cannot be eliminating something foul into the water or into the air? Well, we really can't afford to do something like that because there's too many ways that if you get caught, the penalties are just so severe. And we have nothing to gain from it because uh, we reuse the water that we make. You know, we, we try to be good stewards. Um, we've reduced our groundwater withdrawals by 50% at this plant and at HSC, our refinery, over 55%. We have to live here just like anybody else, and we want it for our children just like everybody else does. Bill, thanks so much for taking your time with us today. We really do appreciate it. We appreciate you coming down to see us. So we're at the Health and Science Center with Jane Crowther. She's the senior director here for the refined oils. Jane, tell us what happens here. This is where highly nutritional omega-3 rich fish oils are produced. All right, so can you take us on a tour and show us what happens? Certainly, come in with me. All right. So Jane, what part of the plant are we in now and what are we seeing going on here? We are on the mezzanine of the oil refinery and we are seeing uh, refining and bleaching and fractionation of Manhattan fish oils. Okay, I understand the refining and the cleaning, but what is refractionation? Fractionation is a cold crystallization step where we reduce the amount of saturated fat or the solid fat in the oil to make it clear and pumpable and flowable. Okay, and that's that's kind of what goes into the human diet? And the animal feed and as the well. Animal feed. Okay. Yes. All right. So what is this first machine? What's our first step here? What's happening? Well, what we're looking at is refining. We're actually doing a saponification of the oil using sodium hydroxide. We are then washing it with water following that in a second centrifuge. The next step after that is bleaching. And bleaching involves adding clays to the oil that pull out color and residual trace metals. And then the fractionation, like I told you, it's a cold crystallization step to reduce the saturates. Okay. Then what happens, where are we, what happens after this part? Well, the oil, if it's going to be dedicated to a human food, we want it to be odorless and tasteless. So we then put it into a deodorizer, and we strip any last flavor and odor out of the oil while preserving the omega-3 content. All right, Jane, so here we are in the lab. And what are you doing here? I'm showing you some Virginia Prime Gold. This is the product that's fully refined, bleached and fractionated, used in premium pet foods. And I just wanted to demonstrate for you what a lovely oil this is. And this, as we talked about earlier, is uh, added directly into a feed for animals, whether it's a premium pet food or it's a poultry feed, a laying hen feed. So this is fully refined. Omega-3s for animals are, are um, very similar to the benefits for humans. Uh, in premium pet foods, for example, omega-3 oils deliver a skin and coat conditioning quality as well as for um, enhancing the performance of the animal, reducing inflammation, reducing recovery time after workout and racing and that sort of thing. 
Uh, Omega-3s are beneficial for humans insofar as uh, reducing the risk of cardiac heart disease, reducing triglycerides, increasing brain and retina development of yeah. infants, um, also for uh, reducing the risk of behavioral disorders. So there you have it, a very brief overview of the Menhaden industry right here in Reedville, Virginia. Thanks so much for watching and have a great week. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming. This program's brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. From apples to zucchini, Virginia farmers work hard to put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org.